Hi, good, e good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to another Summit Together event. Um, we, my name is Christy Levinsky, and Summit Together is an initiative that four other parents, four other moms and myself, um, worked with Principal McDonald to put together starting in the fall. And um, one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to build community and encourage uh, connection here at Summit High School. Um, however, these monthly gatherings, they're for anyone in the community. You don't have to necessar necessarily have a child who's a student at Summit High. But um, anyway, we have been doing um, monthly workshops. Can I get a show of hands who was here in March for our talk on boys? Okay. That was, the room was packed that night. It was, it was fantastic. Um, it's, if the room is packed or it's not, we are going to be here once a month. So I'm happy to see all of your faces. Thank you for coming out to talk about stress. <laughs> um, I want to give a quick breakdown of how tonight's going to work. We have a lot to cover, so I just want to, in respect to everyone's time, give you a sense of how we're going to do this. So in a few minutes, I'm going to have introduce one of our Summit Together students who has a brief announcement or update as to what they're doing here at school um, with a new program they've started um, or they've brought here. It's, it's a program that already exists nationally called We Dine Together. And so anyway, I will let my student leader talk about that and then by, just checking the time, by 6.45 we should get going. I will introduce our speakers tonight and they will present um, for about 20 minutes or so and then they will wrap up a little bit after seven o'clock at that time is when we'll open the room for questions, comments, sharing, criticizing, complimenting, whatever you've got, we would love to hear from you. And that's sort of a huge component to this whole uh, reason we have Summit Together is to get dialogue going with parents and students. Although I don't know if I see many students here, they're probably all doing their sports as I speak. Um, and then I will be making a very uh, a brief interruption by 7.30. Um, we just have two or three important announcements or events we want to announce at 7.30. And depending on how the discussion is going, you guys can then continue and we will conclude um, the discussion after I interrupt with the announcements. We just need to respect the custodial staff's time. They wait here until the building is cleared out. So I just want to give you a heads up. We do have to clear out by 7.45. If you want to grab a chair and help us clear them, that'd be great too. So let's get going. Um, first, we have a brief update from our uh, Summit Together student, Izzy Levinsky. Hi, I'm Izzy. Um, if you've been at the past um, Summit Together parent meetings, then you've probably already heard my announcement. Um, so I've started with a few other students, the We Dine Together Club. Um, we haven't actually brought it in yet or started it, but we put up all the posters around school and we're starting it, planning probably the beginning of next week. So um, you haven't already heard my announcement. It's basically to make sure that no kids eat alone during lunch. Um, if you're a student and you'd like to join or if you have a student that you think might want to join, they can contact me or um, there's a poster right outside the library that has the number to text. So, thank you. Okay, so let's get on with our evening. Our speakers tonight are a duo. They are local health professionals, Andy Deshay and Amy Tatum. Just to give you some background, Andy Deshay is a licensed mental health counselor with a private practice here in Bend. She specializes in working with families, teens, and young adults. She also serves individuals struggling with anxiety, depression, and life transitions. As a former professional counselor at Seven Peaks School, Andy has worked a great deal with elementary and middle school students 
And now in her private practice, Andy works closely with teenagers so they can learn to better handle issues such as anxiety or depression, as well as concerns with social, academic, family, and relationship issues. Andy is also strongly committed to assisting parents when they need guidance and support. Andy's three boys were educated in Ben Lapine schools and all three attended Summit High School. And Amy Tatum is a graduate of UCLA, as well as the Yale School of Nursing. She's been a nurse practitioner in primary care with St. Charles since 2014. She's also a member of St. Charles Medical Group Board of Directors. Amy chairs the St. Charles Medical Group Wellness Committee. And she's a member of the Ben Lapine Schools Budget Committee. She is running unopposed so I can say that tonight, unopposed for the school board uh, election in May. And she is a mom of two young children as well. So everyone, please help me welcome Amy and Andy. Amy Taylor. Yeah, I'm Amy. And I'm not techie, so if I hit the computer a couple of times and leave Marvin down, just go with it. Okay. Oh, I skipped way ahead. Like I said, not techie. All right. So we're going to start by defining stress. What is stress? So stress is a state of mental or emotional strain resulting from adverse or very demanding circumstances. We all experience stress in our daily lives. And as parents sitting here, you're well aware your teens are experiencing it too. So how stressed are teens today? Uh, teens are significant, experiencing a significant amount of stress, which is leading to mental health issues. One in three teen, teens will meet criteria for an anxiety disorder by the age of 18, and 14% will deal with depression. Girls experience anxiety and panic disorders at a two to one prevalence compared with boys, and teen girls also struggle with uh, depression. They're twice as likely to struggle with depression. It should be noted that fewer than half of teens who have these issues actually get the help that they need. 70% of teens see mental health as one of the biggest issues they face, regardless of gender, race, or socioeconomic uh, levels. Some psychologists tie the growth of mental health issues among teens to increased social media use, academic pressure, and scary world events like school shootings. These are some of the causes. But depending on where you live and your socioeconomic level, these stressors are raised differently. Social media is a major stressor pretty much across the board um, because of the, con the idea of the constant surveillance by their peers and the perceived fear of missing out. And one of the things teens don't realize is you see that one perfect image on social media, but they took 50 terrible pictures to get it. So that's always something that's important to keep in mind as, as adults we know. Because I never took a good selfie. <laughs> probably don't either. Um, so, and then our teens, you know, also grew up in a post 9/11 world where school shootings have become commonplace. We see them on our news all the time. And I didn't grow up in that world. Most of you guys didn't either. You know, I remember Columbine very well. It was my freshman year at UCLA. I was coming back in the afternoon from class. Walked into the lobby of my dorm, and there it was on TV. Kids coming out with their hands on their heads, and I was like. What is going on? So that was never something I internalized the way that our kids do today. So as adults, we need to talk about these world events. And we need to let kids know that there are scary events, but they are rare. They are not the probable events that they're likely to experience when they go to school. And so you got to put these things in context, right? 83% um, of our teens worry about getting into a good college. And I'm sure a lot of you here you want your kids to go to a good college, but you know better than to buy their way in. Right? <laughs> um, so, well, buy a building, don't flaunt money. <laughs> or cheat on the SATs. Or cheat on the SATs, yeah. Um, so, you know, you guys are professionals. You are high achieving. You're probably a bit type A. Uh, you have to think about the language you use with your kids around that type of success and saying that not everyone's gonna follow that traditional path and reassuring kids that there are other ways to be successful. Um, and you know, another thing is modeling because we all live with stress and kids pick it up 
the way we verbally and non-verbally express ourselves. So it's important that if we want our kids to learn to cope with stress, we also have to model coping. And that can take many forms that Andy will be discussing in a few minutes. So we also talk about good stress versus bad stress because not all stress is bad. Not all stress is negative, right? There is stress that helps us achieve our goals. It's a positive thing because it pushes us to do more. Um, you know, and so when you're looking at your, your child and how they're processing the event and the stress, you know, are they stressed out of it on exam, but they're working harder to be successful? Is there a game that they really want to be successful at and they're working harder and that is, you know, motivating them? They energize in preparing for it. Or is this something your kid doesn't like to do? They don't want to take the test, they don't want to play the game, but you're pushing it because maybe you have an idea that this is what they want to do. So you know, I think part of your job as a parent is to observe your kids and see how they react to stress so that you can help them identify good stress and bad stress uh, so that they can make the decision of, is this something we should avoid or is this something that is going to push them to be better? Because if we didn't have stress, we'd never accomplish all the great things that we accomplish. And so this is a concept, the hand brain, that I actually learned from a preschool teacher. And so it is kind of silly but I work with kids every day, and I have a four and a seven-year-old at home, so I'm definitely somebody who, you know, when I'm doing an exam on someone, I say tummy instead of belly, and I'm like, oh, abdomen, sorry, tummy. <laughs> I go to a child-like place. Uh, but I think the hand brain is something that's very relevant and very tactile, and something that you'll get the visual image and go, oh, all right. So, you know, as a family nurse practitioner, I talk to people all day long who come from backgrounds very different than my own. And I have to understand, all right, what's your level of education? What's your profession? Because I can't talk to everybody the same way. And in knowing that, you also have to know you can't talk to your teens necessarily the way you talk to an adult or a peer because their brains aren't at that level. So now we have the hand brain, um, which, just bear with me, it's my hand. My wrist is my brain stem. This is responsible for basic functions, you know, sensory, motor output, my heart rate, the fact that I can breathe. My thumb is my amygdala. This is part of my limbic system, and this is responsible for emotional, processing emotions. So conditions like anxiety, depression, and PTSD and phobias are linked to abnormal functioning of the amygdala. The next part of my hand brain is my prefrontal cortex. Uh, this is the rational portion of my brain responsible for executive function, and that allows us to plan complex cognitive behaviors, express our personality, and make thoughtful decisions, and moderate social behavior. Unfortunately, the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed until the age of 25. So when you're talking to your teens about potentially adult things, they're not actually capable of processing things potentially not from a very emotional place. The prefrontal cortex is, is forming, but they might be overwhelmed by their emotions. So if there's something they come to you with that is hyper-emotional and makes them feel overwhelmed, they're responding from their amygdala. And as a parent, if you also respond from your amygdala, how well do you guys think it works when two people are hyper-emotional and trying to communicate? It doesn't. Communication breaks down. So as a parent, if you can understand that piece of brain development and be cognizant of it, you can hopefully ask questions in a way that will help calm your teen's emotions and help them learn to self-regulate. So because of these differences in our brains, teens are hardwired to react to the world emotionally. So we have to, as parents, provide that framework for teens to listen, to improve communication, and to teach them skills that they need to reduce their stress levels. And there was a study recently that showed that uh, teen, teens who suffer from anxiety and depression are more likely to be kids that don't actually trust or communicate with their parents. So that is a really important thing to know, that you gotta think about their brain development and where they are capable of communicating. So, how do teens respond to stress? You guys have probably seen some of these things in your kids. Emotional changes, you know, they might appear agitated, anxious, depressed. In the past month, 40% have reported feelings of irritability or anger. 36% felt nervous or anxious. 31% felt completely overwhelmed. Teens under stress may also experience physical changes. Headaches, abdominal pain, complaining of various aches and pains. 
I see that all the time. Kids come in, chronic abdominal pain, it's often related to something emotional going on with them. And then you might also notice changes in eating or sleeping habits. 35% of teens report lying awake at night, 26% report overeating or eating unhealthy foods, and 23% have skipped a meal in the last month. You may also notice cognitive changes like decreased concentration, forgetfulness, or carelessness. So, now that I have given you a little bit of the background on sources of stress, uh, brain development, how we're experiencing the world, perceptions of the world, I'm gonna pass the conversation over to Andy so she can give you some more practical tips from her uh, view as a counselor. I'm, I'm used to being a little more off the cuff, but I really want to use this time wisely because I think there's so much um, to, to learn from all of you. I mean, one of the things um, that I think is really important is just what we can, that I, I know that all of you out there probably could teach us a lot of things about how you parent. And sometimes that's what's so important about a rich discussion afterwards is, is lots of times some of the things that we might suggest um, <coughs> would be things that you've already doing. So I don't want to underestimate the fact that a lot of this is, is things that you already know. But sometimes, particularly when we're experiencing stress, we, it's hard to remember these things, especially when it's our, our child that's suffering. Um, we're, you guys are experts on your own children, so I'm just going to kind of give you a general idea. But it's for, worth noting that as when all of us got our little kids. We were also <coughs> given that little gift of anxiety, and that's a gift that just keeps on giving. And let me tell you, having three kids in their 20s, it keeps on giving. So just, I'd like to say, first of all, pace yourself. It doesn't end when you drop that suitcase off at the dorm. It's just a new type of, of stress. So, you know, so just know that it doesn't end just when they graduate from high school. And some of you already know that from having older kids. But one of the things is our world is scary right now and we're hearing about things all the time. Um, body image <coughs> issues, technology, cyberbullying, big things that a lot of kids experience existential worries um, about the world, um, <coughs> suicidal behavior, that's a big concern. So it goes on and on and so, when we see our teenagers struggling or are facing challenges and we hear about the threats in the world, I mean, it increases our stress. And so my thing is, how do we manage our own stress and help our teenagers do it too? <coughs> and then how do we encourage our, our teenagers to talk to us? Because one of the main things I know is that we have, all, I can give you all these good ideas about, um, about what to do when you have a conversation, but are they even gonna to come to us? So part of what I wanna address is just how do we be approachable and, and available so that they do come to us? Because a lot of our kids, and I have a, a child like this, is just they're not showing their stress on the outside. It's really a lot on the inside. So being available and being able to have them come to us is a big part of what I wanna address. My hope is that we can work together and that we can and that the kid, we can teach our kids the skills so that they're able to face this stress with fortitude and resilience and ability to understand that they can get through it and that we as parents can help them gain the self efficacy did it so that they can um, know that they can take care of these things, right? and also to have the courage to, to ask for help. Um, much of my knowledge comes from talking to kids in my, in my offices, also from being a school counselor, and I also learned a lot from making my own mistakes with my own kids and learning from them. And, I have, and, and let me tell you, I learned a lot from the kids. That's where a lot of my knowledge comes from. And I'm gonna start with just, um, just, Something that happened to me just the other day is my oldest son <coughs> sent me a text um, with this title, an article attached to it, uh-oh, mom read an article. <laughs> now, I'm just gonna read a little bit of this because I'm glad there's some humor involved. So it starts out with bad news for those that don't like hearing about things they're not interested in over and over again for weeks on end. And it appears 
mom has read an article. Oh God, not this again. Multiple siblings are now confirmed receiving an email from mom with a subject line, saw this on Facebook, important, in which she linked an article alongside with a short note reading, I did not know about this, please be careful. And then my son was kind enough to include his brothers in the text so that they had little comments like, classic mom, and that figures. So I just, you know, I'm just gonna start by saying, first of all, the humor is really a big part of, of what gets us through these things. And, and another part of it is our stress really spreads to our kids, and we are being inundated with articles all the time. It's interesting, too, because Connor now sends me articles all the time, so I've trained him. But um, one of the things is don't underestimate your kids, because they really know a lot, and they're very knowledgeable. And a lot of the things we think we're teaching them, they already know. What it does is kind of increase their stress sometimes. So we want them to be able to find the skills to manage that. And part of that is, is, is talking to them and listening to what they have to say. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is, is just how do we set ourselves up so that our kids will come to us to talk to us. And I think that's a big thing because a lot of us are saying, and I had three kids, one kid just did not talk. And so one of the things I really want to talk about is timing. Uh, a big thing that I hear from kids all the time is, um, you know, our parents are ready to talk, but I'm in the middle of a project or doing my homework. Or in the case of one of my kids, the only time he did talk was one o'clock in the morning. And so I just tended to try to be available at one o'clock in the morning, keeping my fingers crossed that maybe I would hear something. So really pay attention to the fact that there's a lot of, it's really easy to create resistance with our kids when we have an agenda and they're, and they're not in on it. Um, and, and you know, I'm, I'm going to cover a few of these things, but one of them is, is you have conversations with your kids that don't always wrap around college and what's next and, and your future. I think one of the things that, one of the reasons that, that high school does go by so fast is because we're never talking about being in the present. We're always worried about the next step. And when I talk to our, my, my teenagers, Oftentimes they're doing that. They're not even enjoying the successes they have because they've already moved on to the next stressful thing. So we can model being present, having fun. If you can, model taking a break and just relaxing because that's a really great message for our kids too because we just don't do that anymore. Um, listen instead of lecture. I mean, that's a hard one and my husband really needed to learn about that. And my, I overheard my kids talking about how they pretended that they'd watch, or one of them eyes glazed over and we hope he'd get the message. But one of the things that I really think is important is to listen more to them and then ask them about themselves or just asking them about what, you know, even those horrible video games, tell me about that video game. And those are things that just all, all contribute to being available when there's times that they really need to come to us because something's important. Notice what they're doing right. It's oftentimes easy to say, um, you didn't do this, or you need to do this. And so we want to re remind them of what they're doing right, and, and also saying it for ourselves. One of the other things is, is being able to um, try to keep away from comments like, you should or you need to, because I can guarantee that that's when you're faced with resistance. And lots of times it's much more easier to say what you think you should be doing or, or what you think's right for you. Um, when they walk through the door, instead of saying, do you have homework, just saying, how are you today, and giving them some time to decompress. Just being available, not necessarily with them, but just being there so that when there are there is a time when they need you, you're there. And lots of times that's a thankless job because they're not spending all their time with us just saying, Mom, I just want to hear what you have to say, right? <laughs> but that they know that you're there, and that's a very important part of, of, of them feeling like they're, you're approachable. And of course, we could, go, we could have a whole other one of these, and you probably will, about technology. And one of the things is that they are being hit on a constant basis by the technological things of comparing one with each other, the news, the fact that it seems like something's going on all the time. And so as families, if we model, you know, letting go of our de devices, closing our computers, and being real present for our kids when they are around, I think that's really important. 
So you've just done this amazing job. Your kids are really approachable. We want to approach you. And one of the things I just want to, this speaks for itself. It goes along with the hand brain thing is just remember that if you're elevated or flooding or your child is, it's irrational people talking to irrational people and nothing really gets accomplished. So modeling even like, I'm stressed, I need to calm myself down here is a really great way for your, your, your teenager to learn that too. And I say that all the time, like, I can't breathe. I need to just take, put my feet on the floor and be present. So here's a little bit about having a conversation about stress. One of the really important things um, is, is I think I just kind of went through this one a little bit already. Let's do, but here we go. Oh, wait, bear with me. Okay, here we are. Okay, so one of the things to do is just when somebody comes to you, when your child comes to you is and says something, is to, instead of jumping right into rescue, is just say, tell me more about that. All right, I, and then when they do say something, just reflecting back what they said. I feel really stressed right now. I have too much going on. You have too much going on. Because in, rather than saying, oh, you need to, you should, because what we want to do is get them to be able to um, you know, communicate and begin to kind of come up with their own ideas on this. Help them identify their feelings if you can. Like, what's going on in your body? What are you noticing? And maybe help work with them in terms of calming themselves down so they can do some problem solving. The next part is help them think, you know, what do they need? So I oftentimes say, if you had a magic wand, what would, what would it be like? Or what would you wish would, could happen here? What would, what would be important to you? To, if, how would you know that there's change? And then again, they can open-ended questions so they can reply to that. Um, ask them, five minutes, perfect. Ask them, um, uh, ask them what, they, what they would like to do in order to calm themselves down. How can I support you right now? What do you need from me rather than again to, and, and if you can refrain from saying you need to or giving advice, it's, it's really good to say, can I offer some advice? And if they say no, then honor that. Sometimes it's even saying, do you want me to listen or do you want me to help? And sometimes that just gives them the power to make that decision. Um, the other thing is just know when you're having conversations, it's a short time frame. So, they're, so noticing their eyes glaze over or they just, they're exhausted, that might be the very important time for them to take that break and go back into their room. And because these conversations don't all have to end at once. Some techniques for coping with stress, and I bet lots of you are already good at this, and I'm just gonna have you kind of take a glance at it. But one of the things I really like to suggest is letting go of perfection and helping your kids let go of perfection. I think that's a really important one. I think that most of the kids I talk to have some form of perfectionism. The other important thing that I really have found is helpful is helping our teenagers chunk it down. So what I really find effective is when I can say, let's write down what's all going on and see what's, what's happening here. Oftentimes, that may, when they get it out of their spinning around in their brains, they're able to see that really it, it might be handleable. They can take care of these things. And then helping them decipher, is this something you can take action on or is this something that's completely out of your control? And one of the things that we found is that 30% of our worries are about the past, 30% of our worries about the future, 30% about people, 10% of stuff we actually can take action on. And that's really helpful and kind of liberating to know that. Um, I can't emphasize enough about humor and, um, and finding times, you know, and just healthy behaviors like sleeping and eating and um, exercise. Um, this might be helpful for all of us, is just self-care. And I cannot emphasize enough how kids are watching us. And if we're modeling health care, plus, a, a, you know, it's hard to believe, but sometimes our kids are a little bit self-absorbed. And it might be helpful for them to know that we do stuff for ourselves, too. And then also, these are, of course, great ideas. You know, and this is just the tip of the iceberg of all the great things that that people can do to take care of themselves. 
I want to emphasize that if there's a time that you're noticing that, you, that your child really needs some help, there may be some unhealthy behavior, suicidal um, talk, or you get self-harm, those kind of things, ask for help. And, and ask for help and talk to one another and, and move away from the fact that this is a big secret. This is great for us to model for our kids as well because we want them to ask for help. And so this is when you might reach out to someone like me or Amy, or and then we can get them you know, more serious help. And I also think therapy's good even when people aren't in crisis. Just briefly, just a little bit about just what it means to listen instead of lecture, how to communicate, the idea of being relaxed ourselves. I always say scream on the inside, but present a really calm front no matter what they say, right? Our kids are afraid a lot of getting in trouble. That's why sometimes they don't come to us. Disappointing our parents. Um, feeling like if they say, oh, I did this on the phone, we take their phone away. So why are they going to tell you about the phone thing? So being able to think before we take action about the consequences so that they continue to come to us. Um, and that's pretty much it for me. I know I just scratched the surface. But what I'm hoping is that between all of us here, you know, in responding to the two of us, that we can kind of talk about what your experiences might be, any questions you might have. I know we've talked, just briefly touched on all the really difficult, big deal, stressful things that are going on, which would be great conversations in themselves. But this might be a great time for us to start that dialogue. All right.